Hello everyone, I'm Emily Orford from Pluto Press and welcome to the first live collaboration between Pluto Press and Spectre Journal. Spectre Journal is a new Marxist journal promoting analysis, discussion and debate on the revolutionary left, both in the United States and around the world, recovering the insights of black radical thought, the anti-colonial movements, socialist feminism and queer theory. You can visit their website to read a new article by Chintia Arutza on police repression right now. But before we start the event properly, I have a brief announcement from Pluto. Um, the pandemic is an ex existential threat to smaller independent publishers like ourselves. With the disruption to the book trade, we're struggling to keep our heads above the water. To help see us through, we've set up a Patreon offering. Subscriptions cost as little as three pounds a month, and the benefits include eBooks, merchandise, special gifts, extended versions of our podcast radicals in conversation, and much more. So head over to Patreon forward slash Pluto Press to see for yourselves. And on tonight's event, uh, the event's called Life Making versus Death Making, Policing versus Care. We've got a panel of four very special speakers today who have all in their own way been theorizing, writing and organizing around the events that have been unfolding in the US this year. From the rapid spread of the pandemic and the reaction or inaction of Donald Trump's administration and the arms of the state, as well as the extraordinary explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement following the murder of George Floyd. So I'll just introduce our speakers. We have Titi Bhattacharya, the author of Social Reproduction Theory and co-author of Feminism in the 99%, Jesse Hagopian, Seattle teacher and steering committee member of Black Lives Matter at school and co-editor of Teaching Black Lives, Sarah Jaffe, a reporting fellow at Type Media Center and the author of Necessary Trouble and the forthcoming book, What Work Won't Love You Back, and finally, Kathy Kennedy, Vice President of the National Nurses Union and CNA NNOC President-elect. Um, finally, we'll be holding a Q&A section towards the end of the event. So please do put your questions to the speakers in the live chat. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, um, Emily. So um, my name is Didi Bhattacharya and I'm going to uh, start us off with some um, grounding comments and then sort of try to moderate the discussion between our speakers who we are extremely privileged to have together on this panel. Um, so first, before uh, my comments, I wanna say two things. One is I want to acknowledge the amount of emotional turmoil that people have been going through, through COVID and now through the uprising, how many emotions that has thrown up in recent days, especially from communities of color. And I want to acknowledge that before we start. And I want to thank people for taking the time to tune in today um, in, to this talk. The second thing I want to make very clear that as far as Spectre Journal is concerned and uh, many of our comrades around the world, we want to be very clear that we support this uprising unconditionally. We do not, we, this is one of, the, one of the greatest events in recent American history. And it is uh, these series of events are really where we should base our hopes in the coming days and months, both for individuals, for communities, and for the labor movement. So with that, I think I want to um, talk about uh, the, the subject of our talk today, which is about uh, care and death. So life making versus death making. So I want to start by talking about a personal anecdote. I did not grow up in the United States. So when my daughter was two years old and when she went to her first preschool at two, we were told that um, we had a very special community um, uh, worker coming to speak to our two-year-olds that afternoon. And that community worker was a policeman. Of course, this was completely shocking to me that an armed man would come into uh, my two-year-old's classroom and, and talk about their work. So I, of course, made a request to the um, school to take my child out of the room when this so-called community worker came to visit and to give her some books and games um, it, elsewhere. What the um, event taught me 
was something that many of us have known for a long time is that the capitalist state tries at every step to normalize its violence and its violent agents. Dead children in bombed cities are dubbed collateral damage and violent men with guns, the police, are anointed as community helpers. At a moment uh, right now in the United States, public school systems across the country are forecasted to have up to $1 trillion in budget shortfalls. And in the past 30 years, police spending has grown by 445%, according to the Justice Policy Institute. This funding boom, you would think, is because you know um, society is collapsing and crime is rising, but the funding boom is happening, even though, according to the FBI, violent crime has steadily decreased since the 1990s. How much we spend on police is even more astound astounding when you look at it in, the, in terms of city budgets. In Oakland, in California, 41% of the city's spending goes to policing, whereas in Minneapolis, where the recent wave of uprising started, 36% of the city budget is for the police. So let me ask you to reflect upon the fact that violent crime actually declined while the power and budget of the police increased. Why is that? And what, how can we make sense of that? And this is where we are grateful to abolitionists, especially Black abolitionists, who have offered us years of careful research, activism, and analysis to help us make sense of this very strange fact. According to Critical Resistance, one such abolitionist organization that I really urge all of you to visit um, their website for many, many resources. So one of the ways that they um, define the police is they call policing, quote unquote, a social relationship. What that means is that although police departments are tangible brick and mortar institutions, policing itself is a collection of various practices that change over time in order to do the job that the police are supposed to do under capitalism, which as critical resistance says, quote, enforce law and social control through the use of force. So what does that mean in practice? It means that the state and the police propping up that state decide on what decide over the years uh, what acts are quote unquote criminal. They can thus invent new criminal offenses every day. For example, this is my favorite derelict vehicle in the driveway. This crime cost. Loistine Hoskin, a black woman in Ferguson, guess how much? $1,200 in fine, derelict vehicle in the driveway. This is where scholar and abolitionist feminist Ruthie Gilmore's seminal formulation on care work and policing is vital to understand policing as a social relationship. She urges us to understand why what she calls organized abandonment by the state has to necessarily pair with organized violence by the same state. In other words, when the state defunds healthcare, closes hospitals and schools and com communities of color, when they consciously refuse to investigate whether the drinking water supply of a community has been contaminated, this organized abandonment of the community must be kept in place by organized violence. So policing needs to penetrate areas of social life, such as schools, hospitals, parks, which as life-making institutions ought to have nothing to do with death-making. Disciplining 
communities of color, instilling fear and introducing violence into the lives of young black children thus gets woven into the fabric of social life. This is why anti-racism must be a conscious element in our struggles for life making or expansion of our life making institutions such as schools and hospitals. Many people in our labor movements have called for more money for schools and hospitals to take from police budgets and invest in these life making um, institutions. And their claim is that these are universalist demands that will benefit everyone. And of course, we support such demands. But if we do not make specifically anti-racist demands, then we forget that people of color in this country have been consciously left out of the social contract. So think about the, uh, the New Deal, the post-war New Deal. Um, it was supposed to be for everyone, but it was Black people were very consciously left out of the New Deal because agricultural workers could not get the benefits of the welfare state. So in other words, the welfare state in many places we've seen is perfectly compatible with particularist uh, advantages. For instance, welfare states can coexist with racism. So we must be particularly anti-racist when we talk about uh, expansion of welfare functions. So moves to just consolidate that social contract through simple demands like more schools fail to get at how deeply racism is seeded in the workings of capitalism and its death drives. Consider this, when we say we want more schools, often it is through a school, a life-making space that is supposed to nourish and excite a child's creativity that a black child first comes into contact with the criminal justice system, something that our speaker, Jesse Hagopian, has dedicated his life to fighting, which is why also Nurses for Racial Justice, um, a, a group that has just come out through the uprising, is such an important initiative to, because it really, um, you know, as someone said to me recently, think about how to handle someone who is having, um, you know, a, a mental health um, breakdown or some kind of an issue. You don't need violence to do that. Nurses do it all the time. So what, what is the reason to have policemen in our hospitals? Death-making institutions such as the police should really have no space in our communities and movements if we want such spaces to allow life and life making to flourish. This is why we are privileged today to hear from thinkers and activists intimately connected to the labor movement who are leaders of what I call insurrectionary care and fight tirelessly to uphold the right of the working class to life and life making over the right of the state to kill. So without further ado, here is Jesse Agopian. Sorry, I had to unmute there. Thank you so much for those words, Tithi. Uh, it really describes well the dichotomy of the state right now and the choices that are at hand for us. And I wanna bring some, some good life-making news to everybody from Seattle today and begin by letting you know that my union last week passed seven amazing life-making resolutions. Uh, I'm part of the Seattle Education Association, the teachers union here that represents the Seattle teachers, the nurses, the librarians, the instructional assistants, the office professionals, the education support staff. And we overwhelmingly passed a resolution to defund the police in Seattle by 50%, use that money for COVID relief, for healthcare, for education, for counselors, for social workers. Um, but what was incredible to me is that we followed that resolution up with a resolution 
to remove all police from the Seattle public schools altogether. And another resolution to remove the police from the King County Labor Council to say you are not part of the working class. In fact, you are the overseers of the working class and you don't belong in our movement. And I'm thrilled to say that at a, as of late last night, the King County Labor Council took a historic vote and expelled the Seattle uh, Police quote unquote union from uh, the House of Labor. And this was a truly life affirming moment. And there is an, this just breathtaking uprising across the country is really changing the possibilities for remaking our society to be one based on human need and not just the increased profits of the few and spending endless amounts of money to enforce their will and maintain that dramatic inequality that exists in our society. And I wanna just talk for a moment about why we were able to expel the police from the King County Labor Council and from the Seattle Public Schools and why all the educators have now united in this movement to support black lives. And I think it certainly was the video of George Floyd watching those nearly nine minutes of just the sick depraved police officer who just callously crushes George's life out of him as he, as he begs for his mother was just a horrifying moment in history that, that shook a lot of people and I think is definitely a catalyst for this uprising. But I, I also want to suggest to you that the teachers in Seattle were not just solely moved by that one incident, that, that, of course, in our city and cities all over the country, we have our own horrifying moments. We don't have to look beyond our own city limits, right? Today is the third anniversary of the brutal murder of Charlena Lyles. Charlena Lyles is a Seattle resident. She was in her home three years ago today and she felt that someone was breaking into her home. So she called the police for help. And when the police arrived within minutes, they had shot in the hail of seven bullets, three bullets in the back. They shot her down in front of her children. They had to drag her children over her dead body to get them out of the apartment building. The officers who killed Charlena Lyles are still roaming the streets. And we have a mayor here that's talking about solidarity with George Floyd when we have killer cops on the loose here in our own streets. When the police killed a mother of Seattle Public Schools parents, how else do you think we can react but to expel them from our union, right? Uh, and so, you know, we, of course, were horrified by the killings of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others, but our educators have been assaulted by police here in the streets of Seattle, right? I myself on Martin Luther King Day 2015 was hit in the face with a hot stream of pepper spray from a police officer while I was on the phone with my mother coordinating a ride to my son's two-year-old birthday party, clearly not posing any kind of threat. The incident was captured on video. It was transmitted to millions. And yet the officer who assaulted me without provocation is still walking the streets, right? If you wanna know why Seattle educators took this bold move to expel police from our schools and from the King County Labor Council and to demand the defunding of the police, you need to know about my commute to work where I pass the new youth jail that's been under construction for the last years has now opened to cage children. 
This is a $200 million facility. And they have invested uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, spared no expense to put our kids behind bars, but they can't find the money to support our kids with counselors. Uh, we have 2000 kids at our school and four counselors, right? I mean, here in Seattle, we're in that shadow of Amazon and Microsoft and Boeing and Starbucks and all these corporations on and on. And yet we have 40,000 homeless kids in our state. At the school that I teach at, Garfield High School, there are 150 homeless kids. Right, these are the priorities of this state that truly don't care about our kids, about our youth, about working people. And because they don't care, they have to enforce brutality because people will fight back, people will organize. And when they do, uh, that's the role of the police. And it's really what the police have been there for for a, a long time and we see Ruth Gilmore's concept of organized abandonment play out in our city day after day. Uh, and this is why we built the Black Lives Matter at School movement that I want to tell you about. Because in 2016, there was an elementary school here in Seattle called John Muir Elementary. And they had organized an event where they were gonna have the parents and community members and the educators all out front of the school at the beginning of the school year to celebrate their black students' lives. They were gonna high five all the kids as they came into the, the school, hold a, a black history assembly in September, not waiting for February. And the art teacher designed a beautiful shirt that said, Black Lives Matter, we stand together. And then it was leaked to the media that teachers would wear Black Lives Matter shirts and Blue Lives Matter website carried the story and thousands began streaming the school with, with insults and hate mail. And then one particularly hateful person made a bomb threat on an elementary school for the audacity of those educators to publicly declare that they support their black children's lives. And so I approached the teachers at John Muir Elementary and I asked them, what can we do to support you? And we came up with a plan. We organized with other members of the social equity educators in uh, our union caucus here. And we brought forward a resolution to the broader union to say we stand in solidarity with John Muir. But we knew that it couldn't just be that we stand in solidarity with them because if we really were in solidarity with them, we would all wear shirts to school that said Black Lives Matter. And so then we began organizing, bringing in the citywide PTA and the NAACP and the Black Student Unions and different community organizations holding press conferences. And we organized 3,000 out of the 5,000 teachers to come to school that year wearing Black Lives Matter shirts, teaching lessons about institutional racism, about the long struggle uh, for Black freedom, and about the many contributions uh, of Black people to this nation about black intersectional identities. And it was an eruption that truly caught me off guard and signaled that Seattle's educators were ready to join the struggle. And it was caught on the news. Courageous educators in Philadelphia saw what we had done and they took it to the next level. They took it from a day of action to a week of action. They broke down the 13 principles of the Black Lives Matter Global Network into teaching points for each day of the week. And then they helped to galvanize a national movement. And ever since we've been in a coalition all across the country for Black Lives Matter at School Week, the first week of February. 
And we came up with four demands that we're organizing around. The first one is to end zero tolerance discipline and replace it with restorative justice. And that's because we know black students are suspended at four times the rates of white students for the same infractions. And in fact, it's black girls who are most disproportionately suspended at seven times the rates of white girls, right? And we, second, we said we demand to hire more black teachers. We know that there's been some 26,000 black teachers lost in the American public school system in the last uh, 20 years. And we've seen them get pushed out of school, school after school. And we know that our students of color perform and graduate at, at higher rates when they have teachers that look like them. We said as well, we wanna mandate ethnic studies and black history, kindergarten through high school. And we know that uh, ethnic studies has been shown to dramatically improve graduation rates, but also empower students to understand the long history of struggles for social justice throughout this country's history. And finally, we said we want to fund counselors and not cops. And that's because 1.6 million children in the United States go to a school that has a police officer, but not a counselor, right? And that's not a mistake. That is uh, exactly what organized abandonment looks like. That's what the school to prison pipeline uh, looks like. In history. Uh, and I just want to say that it's to me uh, shouldn't surprise people when they see horrific videos of police brutalizing kids in our schools or people in the streets when you look at what the origins of the police are in breaking strikes in the north and slave patrols uh, in the south. And you know, when I teach my students the history of social movements to, to uproot institutional racism or to fight for the eight hour day or for LGBTQ rights and the Stonewall Rebellion, every single one of those struggles that I teach my students about, the police were on the wrong side. They were on the side of arresting Rosa Parks, of busting up the Stonewall Rebellion, right? Of killing the Haymarket martyrs and uh, stopping the movement for the eight hour day. And so they can't be on our side. They've never been on our side. They're not interested in stopping crime, actually. They're interested in brutalizing black indigenous and people of color. They're interested in maintaining a social order that is vastly unequal. If they were interested in stopping crime, there would be a whole lot of hedge fund managers and insurance uh, company bankers and uh, the wealthiest people who sabotaged the global economy and crashed uh, this economy in, in 2008 and, and now again. There would be a lot of people who voted for disastrous wars that killed hundreds of thousands of people in the Middle East, those would be behind bars if the cops were interested in stopping crime. And I just wanna end by saying that uh, there are many examples of what we need to invest in instead of police. We know that uh, it's actually investing in restorative justice, in conflict mediators, um, in counselors and, and trauma counselors in our schools that will uproot the roots of violence and eliminate the need for policing altogether. And a hundred years ago in Seattle, there was the 19 general strike and the entire city went on strike. And the beautiful thing about that strike was that we didn't just shut the whole city down, working people reopened it under labor's management. And we actually had our own peacekeepers in the streets that were able to negotiate uh, and, and 
do conflict resolution. This has happened on citywide scales and now we're beginning to see experiments with cut defunding police and talking about dismantling them all around the country. And I'm so uh, honored to be with all of you on the panel here today to talk about how we move forward in, in truly abolishing the police and moving to a just and humane society. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Jesse, for those powerful words. And what good news you bring to this panel. I am so happy. So um, I'm sure for those of you listening in, if you have questions for any of our speakers, please write those in into the chat. Um, if you want more information about how to organize your own Black Lives Matter in schools, please write that in and we can be in touch um, with, with you as well. So our next speaker need no introduction to the labor movement, Sarah Jaffe who has written insistently and consistently about the importance of care work above the, um, the, the rights of the police to uh, kill with impunity. Sara, take it away. Uh, let me take myself off mute. Um, I do not have any exciting news like Jesse did, which is a real bummer. Um, I'm sorry, but I'm very glad that we got to start with that. So I was thinking this morning about what I was going to talk about on this call today. And the thing that came to mind was the 2011 anti-union bill in Wisconsin. And I was thinking about that because it was an attack on public sector workers taking away their right to collective bargaining, um, among many other things. And Scott Walker um, probably also needs no introduction to this crowd, but was the right wing governor of Wisconsin now thankfully gone. Um, he carved out the police and firefighters from his attack on public sector workers, saying, you know, giving them the right to hang on to their collective bargaining. And so what it ended up being was sort of a very clearly gendered attack because who were the unions, who were the public sector workers that were still losing their rights? They were teachers, they were professors at the university, but they were also social workers. Um, the, the public sector has been for a long time disproportionately a place where black workers could find jobs when the private sector is, well, you know, more racist and has fewer restrictions on their ability to be racist. So thinking about that, and the question that we're facing now because the coronavirus related um, economic crisis that we're in, right? Where states and cities, unless they get funds from the federal government, which the federal government is still farting around and not doing, are gonna be in massive, massive budget crises very soon. And so in this, in this moment, calls to defund the police are hitting and maybe being lent extra weight by the fact that states and cities are actually looking for places to cut right now. But we see this, um, this opposition between police and life-making workers drawn up in many places. Um, Scott Walker certainly didn't invent it. And I was also thinking about the way that the sort of story of the welfare queen, right? That we got cuts to what we used to think of as, as welfare, although that word is slippery. The, the particular program that got destroyed gleefully by Bill Clinton in the mid nineties was the um, Aid to Families with Dependent Children program, AFDC. And that had been for a long time, a program that mostly helped white women take care of their children when there was no longer a male breadwinner in the house. And when it began to actually be accessible to black women, when they began to organize and agitate for their right to have the same rights as white women, that's when the program began to be demonized by people like Ronald Reagan with his famous stereotype of a black woman driving a Cadillac with her welfare payments, which anybody who's ever been on AFDC or certainly its replacement can tell you is pretty unlikely. Um, but that kind of welfare queen myth has actually been turned around and used against public sector workers. So if you read sort of conservative arguments around teachers unions, for example, 
the argument is that they are lazy and getting fat on public taxpayer dollars. Um, the extension of the welfare queen story to that of a 80 to 90% female workforce is, I mean, obvious, right? We can see where that comes from. So we see again and again this, this um, race, the story of racism being mobilized through gender to damage a set of workers that is not, of course, limited to just Black women, just women uh, at all. So that's the thing that was going through my mind this morning to frame this conversation. Um, we're in the middle of an amazing, as Tiffy was saying, really incredible moment of uprising. Um, I write about labor, but I also write about social movements. And so I've been out in the streets with some of the protesters. The banner in my background is a photo that I took last week at a march in West Philadelphia, where I live, which was from the Move House, which for those of you who don't know that story, in 1985, the Philadelphia police, with the support of the mayor and the attorney general at Rendell at the time, for those of you who know that name, um, they dropped a bomb on a house that was home to an organization of black activists. And then they decided to let the fire burn. There's a documentary by that name you can watch and burn down an entire city block. So the protests today are of course calling attention to that history as well. Um, but this banner behind me like move virtually out of the way that said care not cops is really striking to me because what I'm seeing in these protests is that being put into practice. Um, so I've written about the sort of social reproduction of the protests, the people who are showing up to do the work, not just of um, organizing the march, but of bringing water and food, masks and hand sanitizer in this moment, right, are incredibly important, um, as Kathy will no doubt talk about. Um, and this is building on the work that not just um, organizations for Black Lives have been doing, but the mutual aid networks that have been growing during the coronavirus pandemic, um, and also putting the actual logic of abolition into action, which is pretty well summed up by this Care Not Cops banner, right? So when I think about abolitionist organizing, and when I try to explain it to people who are, are new to hearing this phrase, abolish the police, um, I talk about things like swipe it forward campaigns in places like New York, where people will swipe people onto the subway for free so they don't jump the turnstile if they can't afford to get on the subway and then they don't get harassed and arrested and ticketed by the NYPD. Um, I think about people doing free food campaigns, um, brake light clinics where people will for free replace brake lights that are out so you don't get pulled over by the police and then have them use that as a pretext to search your car and harass you and all sorts of other things that happen when people are driving while black. Um, bail funds, which again, sort of broke into the mainstream with this round of protests with a ton of people donating something like $35 million to the Minnesota Freedom Fund. Bail funds have been started by activist groups for a long time to do the very practical work of getting people out of jail who are only in there because they cannot afford cash bail. And we saw that expand again during the pandemic when people noted that prisons, prison conditions were a place where the pandemic could spread easily because people are locked down in close contact with other humans. Um, and so you saw campaigns to free elderly prisoners, to free anybody at risk, to basically free everybody. Um, again, as this sort of practical work of abolition, which is the practical work of caring for people. Um, so I'm going to wrap up in just a second, but I wanted to loop back to something that Tithi was saying at the beginning about these invented crimes and how the police can invent crimes. And we all, those of us in major cities, have experienced this firsthand in the last few weeks because we had curfews imposed on us. And so this morning, I was recording from a podcast the story of an essential worker who was on the way between his one, of, one to two of his three jobs, was arrested for being out past curfew, even though he had a piece of paper saying he was an essential worker and thrown in jail for a week for parole violations, for going 
between his jobs. Um, and so the curfews were a universalized experience of what happens all the time in communities of color with arbitrary policing, right? So in Philadelphia, we had a 6 p.m. curfew a few nights. And we found out about it with a little uh, notification on our cell phone, right? It would blow up about, about 10, 15, 20 minutes before curfew. So if I was on the other side of town, the subways were closed down already. How do I get home by the end of curfew? I don't. Now I'm white, so I was less likely to be harassed for it than somebody like Devonte Williams, who was this worker who was put in jail again for a week for it. And so when we think about the question of, of care, not cops, and we think about the question of crimes, right? A lot of people, when you say something like abolish the police, will be like, but what about the crimes? We have to remember, again, that these are crimes that are invented, that this is a security force that is carved out and understood as different from the rest of the working class, not just by other workers and their unions, as Jesse was just talking about, but also by the people for whom they work, right? By the Scott Walkers of the world. And as we go into these budget fights where people are going to be, you know, on some level having these um, zero sum fights over whether we're going to put that money into public schools, whether we're going to put that money into healthcare, or whether we're going to put it into policing, it's going to be an interesting time to talk about all these things and to figure out ways to talk about more expansively than just a line of numbers in a column, but actually why we need to invest in healthcare, education, all of the things that actually care for people rather than police. Thanks so much for that, Sarah. It was, um, it was great and what a um, wonderful way to loop in the whole question of the Wisconsin uprising with the curfews at this time. Thanks so much. Our uh, next speaker is Kathy Kennedy. She is the vice president of the National Nurses Union. And for those of you who live in the United States and know anything about the labor movement, know that nurses have been like teachers in the absolute front lines of fighting austerity and doing the work of keeping us alive during COVID-19. One of the most powerful um, protests that I have seen in my lifetime were nurses reading the names of their fallen comrades in front of the White House while uh, the, our you know, um, terrorist in chief lies hidden in the bunkers behind these um, walls. So I would really like us to welcome Kathy and we're so looking forward to your reflections, Kathy. Well, thank you for that introduction, Stevie. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Kathy Kennedy. I've been a nurse for 40 years. I still actually work at the bedside. And let me just say before I get started that NNU, National Nurses United, is the largest professional association and union of registered nurses in the United States. You know, our nurses have been on the front lines of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, fighting for their lives, their patients, and their communities just to get basic personal protective equipment, PPE, that we need to protect ourselves and our patients from getting sick. And when we first heard about this unnamed virus um, that was devastating central China back in January, our union immediately set to work to assess hospitals' preparedness for this epidemic. For years, hospitals in the United States have been guilty of short staffing and drawing on so-called just-in-time supply chains that systematically left nurses without adequate equipment to care for patients under even normal circumstances. And it was noticeably clear that before COVID-19 arrived in the United States, that profit-seeking in the US healthcare had created a precarious situation that threatened to be woefully dangerous for patients, healthcare workers, and our communities. Now, a half a year later, nurses are still demanding that the Senate act on legislation to protect workers. And with many of the states um, prematurely reopening their economies and relaxing social distancing protocols, we're already beginning to see new surges of new cases 
and experts are still warning of a second wave in the fall and nurses and healthcare workers still don't have the basic protective equipment that we need to care for our patients. You know, we've been able to put pressure on the House to pass the HEROES Act, but nurses are still calling on the Senate to pass this legislation, which would use the Defense Production Act to direct manufacturers here in the United States to immediately start producing adequate supplies of PPE to fight COVID for the long haul. And then we are also asking to mandate um, OSHA, which is the Occupational Safety and Health um, Administration, to establish a uh, emergency temporary standard of infectious diseases for the workers. Uh, and, and that is just so important for us. By comparison, the speed at which state leaders and the president mobilizing a uh, coordinated police effort to suppress, suppress protesters who have courageously taken to the streets to resist these deep-seated structural racism have, have viscerally, it's a visceral testament on how invested corporate and political elites are really looking at protecting property and profits over human life. I had to think about this for a minute because it's just, it's unbelievable that they would value property than they would human life. As nurses, we've been fighting for the last six months for bare minimum safety equipment. And we're working real hard with our collective advocacy to make hospitals safe to be able to take care of our families and to treat patients whose lives are being regarded as collateral by governments who are casually willing to accept greater amounts of illness and death in order to reopen the economy. Just imagine that. Nurses and frontline workers are forced to fight every day for simple resources like N95 respirator masks and gowns so that we can curtail the virus and to keep our community safe, keep us all safe. Yet, what has starkly exposed the national and state response to protesters in recent weeks is that rather than investing in care and necessary services that our communities really need, our country has instead invested in violence, providing police and National Guards with elaborate riot gear and unlimited supply of high-tech weapons like pepper spray, tear gas, flashbang grenades, rubber bullets. As a nurse, for me, it is extremely difficult to fathom how we have gotten to the point where we, where we over-resource systems that result in brutality while defunding care unbelievable. In our hospitals, nurses are witnessing firsthand how untreated structural racism has turned a pandemic into a humanitarian catastrophe. Black and Latinx and indigenous communities have been hit hardest by COVID-19 because of conditions of economic inequality and environmental racism that has intersected with racial discrimination in ways that black and brown people are more vulnerable to exposure and complications caused by this virus. You know, the devaluation of essential service work has put black and brown workers on the front lines of this pandemic at higher rates without adequate PPE, which puts our families at risk when we go home at night. For decades, decades, our communities have been overexposed to industrial toxins that cause high rates of uh, asthma, immune compromising chronic diseases that make exposure to COVID-19 that much more deadly. Further, rather than invest in care, our for-profit health system is set up, set up. So patients with the highest health needs are the least likely to get health access. With rising rates of hospital mergers and acquisitions, hospitals in poor and rural areas 
where profit margins are low for health companies have been closing at alarming rates for years. Corporate hospital chains also are cutting essential services for medically underserved community at disproportionately it, uh, impact the African-American and Latinx um, communities. For example, HCA, which is the nation's largest for-profit hospital system, just received $1 billion in federal pandemic bailout. Yet, at the end of May, all maternal child services at a large San Jose hospital in California closed, and it was in a low-income community. That's terrible. Add to that systematic hospital discrimination and the fact that health insurance is tied to employment in the United States, leaving underpaid black and brown workers with higher rates of uninsurance or underinsurance. And the, that's a toxic mixture that leaves us with a careless formula for widespread public health disaster, which is what we're experiencing right now. As Union of Health Workers, we stand in solidarity with the protesters who have taken on this enormous personal and collective risk to advocate for their health, the health of their communities, and the public health of the United States. The collective uprisings and actions over the past weeks calling on our country to address the structural racism that have led to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Rashard Brooks, and so many others are collectively organized public health interventions. As nurses, we know that there are inherent risks in protesting amidst of a pandemic, but we know that the risk of systemic racism and economic injustice outweighs the danger for many. So as nurses, we are putting out guidelines to make sure that everyone is safe when they're, pro when they're participating in these protests. And we're gonna share those with you guys. We, we as nurses continue to advocate for our patients and our communities, and we will continue to work with them to keep everyone well, whether we encounter, encounter them at the bedside or during a protest. The majority outcome of 40 years of austerity budget cuts, which have meant slashing and burning of systems and institutions that once were the backbone of social care in our society, has been devastating inequality that nurses see that show up at the bedside as more chronic and acute health crisis. To mitigate this devastation caused by years and years of defunding care work, we see a massive expansion of scope and intensity of policing, as everyone has been saying so far. Nearly every social problem in poor and non-white communities have been turned over to the police to manage. Native American health care has been chronically underfunded, spending only a fraction per person covered as other federal health programs. And in the United States, local public health departments lost an estimated 57,000 staff position due to defunding between 2008 and 2017. A majority of cities spend as much as 40% of their municipal budgets on policing, leaving dwindling resources for poverty prevention, public health infrastructure, and everything else. These policy and budget decisions that deny the humanity of people and pave the way for those in positions of power to adopt laws, policies, and practices that perpetuate economic and political determinants of poor health and racism. You know, at the same time, the cities across the countries have defunded necessary health services, educational programs, mental health services, and drug treatments programs for 40 years and yet they expand the scope of police intervention to make police departments responsible for addressing social issues that police officers are not trained to treat, just as Jesse said and Sarah said. Social challenges of racism and inequality have been exposed and intensified 
by COVID. These problems must be treated with care by trained caregivers, not through criminalization, school policing, or incarceration. The alternative to police violence is not to increase funding and technology for police systems that were never, ever designed for care. The city of Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed, invested $4.75 million in 2015 to train police officers to respond to mental health crisis, how to de-escalate conflict, how to be aware of implicit racism and bias, and hold police community dialogues for police reform. But none of this prevented George Floyd's death. We need to reinvest in social solutions to problems poor people face every single day. We need publicly financed, supportive housing, community, and care-based anti-violent programs. We need jobs, daycare services, and we need to support institutions that are designed to provide care. Protests are necessary, but so is the tough and often thankless work to pressure politicians to reinvest in care by putting their pen to the paper and promises for justice into practice. Reinvestment in programs that have been cut by austerity and the fight for racial justice is a local, national, and global issue. In 2013, our union band together with nurse unions from around the world, creating Global Nurses United. And GNU is the federation of a, the premier nurse and healthcare worker unions in 29 countries, nations. GNU was formed in the spirit of solidarity around the principle that all people deserve access to health care as a human right. The Federation was born from the idea that we are one planet, one people dedicated to caring for each other. Nurses like essential workers everywhere face common threats, and these include attacks on public health, and on the healthcare workers, austerity, privatization of policies, climate crisis, and global pandemics. In the United States, these attacks are often rooted in structural racism, but they affect wor workers worldwide. In addition to supporting the protesters who are filling the streets and cities across the world with demands for safety, public health, and an end to corporate control over our lives, nurses are uniting globally around a shared vision to rebuild the world through a caring economy. This means implementing Medicare for all to push the greed out of healthcare and holding our workplaces accountable to their workers and the communities that they serve. Our union remains deeply committed to advancing our campaigns for Medicare for all and reinvesting in the care and services our communities need, such as housing, education, healthcare, as well as environmental justice. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic calls on us to push for total health system transformation. And it's not enough for healthcare institutions to, to stand against racism and protesters. The real test is whether these institutions who have profited from our pain are willing to invest their workers with adequate safety protection and investing in the care that people so direly need. That is what we stand for as nurses, why we collectively stand as a union, and it is why nurses have the tenacity to fight on until our vision and values for a caring and a compassionate society is one. So I wanna close by saying, as we renew our demand that black lives matter, racial justice is a healthcare justice. The time is now and change needs to happen. Structural change and we stand in solidarity with our patients, our allies, our communities, and we are ready to seize time. So let's do this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was amazing. That was so powerful. I especially liked um, the, the point you made about the uprisings being you called it a public health intervention. That was a wonderful way to actually frame these uprisings. So um, the way we're gonna do it for those of you who are listening in, 
I'm going to ask our um, panelists a couple of questions and ask them to reflect on those questions. Um, so we'll do two rounds of that, and then we'll go back to your questions that you have asked in the chat. So please keep them coming. So, uh, you know, to go back to uh, where Kathy ended uh, by calling the uprisings a public health intervention, uh, many people have called racism a virus. And, you know, actually, I kind of disagree a little bit with that formulation because viruses are natural phenomenons and they do not have, you know, the kind of intention that uh, racism has. And racism is the result of public policies. Um, it is not a naturally occurring thing. It is a very clear, conscious public policy decisions that build, produce, and sustain racism. So from all your talks, you have basically given us this sort of history of both racialized violence as well as the resistance to it. Each one of you have touched upon that. So I just wanted to ask you guys to learn from you where you see the historical legacy of these protests. Do, because, you know, to an outsider to the left, the protest may seem spontaneous. For those of us in the left, we can see the protests rooted in previous legacies of protests, not just for racial justice, for, for justice in all its, um, you know, manifestations like, um, Sarah went back to talking about um, the Wisconsin uprising and Jesse talked about slave patrols, you know, how these, these have connecting threads. So I want to hear from you um, where you situate the origins of this round of protests in, in this coming year. So um, shall we go by the order of speakers we originally started with? Okay, so Jesse, you're up. Sure. I think we need to really sit with and try to comprehend the scale of what's going on right now. The Washington Post ran an article that said, this is the broadest social protest in US history, that there are more towns take, that have taken part in Black Lives Matter struggles than, than ever before. Um, I think that the Women's March was a high water mark as well in American history for numbers of people that have participated in a protest. But that was also a one day event. It was a breathtaking and really powerful uh, struggle that I think helped um, open up the doors for the Me Too movement to um, really flourish and to hold sexual abusers and assaulters accountable and it was really an important day but to see ongoing protests day after day after day week after week in in of course all the major cities in all 50 states but in many little towns as well is something that we we need to really try to grapple with how and why is this happening and I think there's a couple things at play here. I think one thing we need to understand historically is that the black struggle has really been an access point that's turned all other struggles in this country. So when the civil rights movement erupted in the mid 1950s, early 60s, it really ignited a whole series of struggles for social justice. It was the American Indian movement, right? The, the women's liberation movement, the queer liberation movement, um, the movement to end the wars in Vietnam, like these mass movements uh, gained confidence and strength from the black movement because you gotta remember how stifling McCarthyism had been that anybody who challenged the government was labeled a communist and you could be uh, blackballed, fired from your job, imprisoned. Uh, and it was very difficult to challenge or build collective social movements. And when black people rose up and had had enough with Jim Crow and had found strategies for collective organizing, it showed all other oppressed and exploited people 
in the US that you could also rise up. And I think we're seeing something similar today because I think that what's incredible about this movement is people are in the streets for black lives. You can see the signs and hear the chants in little towns and, and huge metropolises across the country. But I don't think they're only there for black lives. I think that there's a whole series of grievances that all working and oppressed people have in, in this era of neoliberalism that has disinvested from the public spaces and invested all that money into private corporations and line the pockets of the wealthiest. When you have eight people have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people on the planet, you have to realize that that money has been pilfered from the, the neediest in this country. When you have uh, people who can't attend college because they can't afford it or they do and they're paying back their college loans for the rest of their life, when you have half of public school children in the United States living in poverty and qualifying for food, uh, free and reduced lunch, um, what you understand is that the masses of people in this country can't continue with life as it is. And that the, the ugliest face of uh, oppression is that knee on the neck of George Floyd and the many uh, martyrs of our black people who have been shot down in the streets. But what that is doing is ripping the mask off of this neoliberal capitalist society and saying um, that everybody has grievances in this society. Everybody is facing some level of exploitation and they are ready to take to the streets to fight against the most egregious aspect. But I think that those sitting at the top of society had better watch their back because there's a whole lot of people who are coming for them right now uh, who are going to be taking the money out of the wealthiest 1% uh, and investing that in, in our communities far and wide in, in um, the multiracial working class uh, is, is gaining confidence and strength. And I can't wait to see how far this movement goes. Jesse, I'm glad I'm wearing uh, glasses because you can't see me tearing up. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, you're next. Everything that Jesse said. Um, so I wrote a book about the social movements of the post financial, the post 2008 era, basically in the US. Um, and that was connecting the dots between the crisis, between things like Occupy Wall Street and the movement that sprang up around the first iteration maybe of Black Lives Matter and the I don't even know what iteration to call it of the long black freedom struggle in this country um, around Ferguson, around Trayvon Martin, um, the way all of these movements connected. And so the thing that I'm thinking about right now in looking at this movement, um, there's a few things. One is the unemployment numbers that we've been facing. Um, that over three months in, and I'm reading this from a press release today from the Economic Policy Institute, over three months in, job losses remain at historic levels. More than one in five workers are either on unemployment benefits or are waiting to get on right now. Um, we know, of course, in this country that on a normal day, the Black unemployment rate is twice the white unemployment rate. That is just a statistic that's held true for a very long time. Um, so I don't have the exact numbers breaking down these layoffs by demographics, but I would imagine that that holds true. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has disproportionately affected black and brown people and disproportionately killed black and brown people. Um, when you look at those unemployment numbers, that means a bunch of those people just lost their health insurance, as Kathy was just saying. Um, so you have, in all of these conditions, you have something that is disproportionately affecting Black people, but that is also affecting a hell of a lot of other people. And I think in this moment, that helps us to understand when we see what happened to George Floyd, what's happening to all of us. 
Um, I think that's a really, really, really important point to make. And then this other thing, um, Tithy and I, before planning this talk, have been like sending back and forth links about things that are just like, um, you know, the social reproduction of the protests or um, conversations about the police having all this equipment while these other workers don't. Um, I think the work that Kathy and NNU have done to draw attention to the fact that healthcare workers don't have PPE right now. I think that's really, really been striking for a lot of people. People are aware that this is a crisis we went into totally unprepared while the police seem to have a never ending supply of tear gas. Um, I kept tweeting pictures of and articles of, you know, social distancing arrests before the protest kicked off with this is not essential work. Um, my friend Michael Denzel Smith, who is also an author with um, my same publisher, said on, I think it was Democracy Now! recently, you know, we've just had a whole conversation about what essential work is in this country and police have proved that they're not essential workers and people are seeing that. And so I think all of this is why, even though, you know, a people were smugly trumpeting a poll today that shows only like 11% of America wants to abolish the police, which I would say 11% is a lot actually, that's more than I expected. Um, but the demand to defund the police is taking off in this moment because people can see very, very clearly in their own lives and experience how completely screwed up our priorities are as a country. Sarah, Cassie? Yeah, you know, just listening to both Jess, Jesse and Sarah, you know, as, as a nurse, when we think about um, this whole issue, you know, and why people are out on the streets and why, you know, they've taken a hold of Black Lives Matter, seeing George Floyd being killed um, and, and just watching that. I mean, we're there, you know, and one of the things that working in the hospital, we don't have what we need. We don't have PPE to take care of our patients to make sure not only our patients are safe, but as nurses that we need to be safe. So the hospitals have never been prepared and we've been, we've known about this since January. Um, and, and to see that police, they spend more money with policing uh, and law enforcement, uh, we see this as a huge problem. When we, we look at our black and brown uh, people of color that are trying to, that are very, very sick and they can't even get the tests that they need and they're told, go home, you know, it's the flu, drink plenty of fluids, but yet quarantine yourself and, you know, and if the symptoms get worse, come back, but yet they, when they do come back, they're turned away. And so death rates of black folks are so high uh, because they just don't have access or they're, they're being told that, you know, there was one comment where, you know, a son said, you know, his father died. And it's like, you know, we're not, we're not valued. You know, we don't need any additional tests because they see us as different black folks. And so that's a problem. So as nurses, you know, we've always been in the front line, you know, really fighting for justice and the importance of being able to take care of everyone. But uh, we're right there in the streets, you know, even during this pandemic, but we want to make sure that everybody is safe and um, yeah, we're in it for the long haul. But there is definitely, definitely a problem. Thanks, Cassie. So um, final question to you before we turn to the audience. Uh, we've all been talking about abolition and abolitionists have directed our attention to what abolition means. You know, the word itself sounds as if we're calling for negative thing that we are trying to take away, but abolitionists, um, have drawn our attention to how abolitionism is actually about building. It's a regenerative demand. It is asking for things. Um, and taking away the police is actually not a real taking away from society. It is about healing society and giving society other resources that society actually needs. So this is a definition we have from abolitionists and um, you know people who fight uh, the prison industrial complex. So I wanna hear from all of you 
a little bit about what abolitionism means to you, either in sort of broad strokes or in concrete ways. Sure. I mean, it's so exciting that there is a mounting conversation in this country around alternatives to the police. Um, I think just like the way we heard Kathy talk about how um, movement in the streets is a movement for public health, right? To how this uprising is a public health. It also connects to my profession because I think that the greatest teacher in the, the country today is the social struggle and the youth themselves who are educating the entire nation about the long history of oppression, about police violence and about alternatives to police violence. I think that we need to understand the, the phrase, hurt people, hurt people, and whole people, heal people, right? Hurt people will hurt other people, but whole people can heal people. And what we mean by that is that we've created a society that's organized around poor health outcomes, are organized around punishment and, and hurting people. And so though that, that is what produces violence, right? In our communities because people are hurt. But when we make people whole, we can see that we can have beautiful communities. And, you know, we're seeing beautiful communities of struggle around the country uh, right now. There's little glimpses of what it could look like without police happening right now. Um, in my own city, we have the CHOP neighborhood that's been added to Seattle, the Capitol Hill organized protest, formerly known as CHAZ, uh, and it's a police-free zone. They ran the police out of their own precinct. <laughs> it's, it's an incredible, uh, it's hard to even imagine that this happened. I've marched on that precinct with students in the student union year after year. We marched on it after, uh, after Mike Brown was killed and there was no indictment of officer Darren Wilson. Um, and they showed up in riot gear on horseback um, with all these weapons to meet my high school students. And now they are gone from that facility and it is now being controlled by people who have painted a mural of Charlena Lyles right, who, ha who are doing film screenings in the evening of 13th, um, who have renamed the street Black Lives Matter streets into a beautiful mural, right, and they, we have the no cop co-op there, and we have our own peacekeepers there, right, and in marches all around the city, people have demanded that the police not show up, Right, And in fact, they're far safer when we have our own bike, bike brigade that, that does the traffic control, right? And so I think what you said, Tithi, is absolutely right. We're not just about abolishing. We, we, we do want to abolish the police. We also want to abolish the social conditions that create violence in the first place, uh, which is the disinvestment in our community, the organized abandonment that the great abolitionist Ruth Gilmore talks about. But we also want to create a beautiful new future by investing in our youth, by taking that $200 million that they use to build cages for our children in the new youth jail and use that uh, for a nurse in every school building. I mean, really in Seattle, with Amazon and Microsoft and Boeing and Starbucks, we can't have a nurse in every school. That's absurd. We want to invest in uh, the future of our kids. We have restorative justice programs right now that include a program in the south end of Seattle that has community uh, mitigators who are trained in de-escalation who are go around in the community and help de-escalate uh, uh, conflicts and they're not armed, right? There are so many beautiful examples of how we can organize public safety in a way that's actually meant to heal and support our children and our communities rather than punish uh, and brutalize. And, and that's the future we're fighting for.
Thank you, Jesse. Sarah? Yeah, I keep going back to the question of essential work, right? Um, I'm thinking about uh, my friend Kelly Hayes, who's a writer and an organizer and a podcaster um, over at Truthout, saying abolition is a construction project, which is great. And, and the restorative justice programs that Jesse is talking about that some teachers unions have fought for getting into their schools. Um, all of that is amazing. But I think one of the things that I am well, one of the things that I'm always thinking about, but particularly in the sort of post-coronavirus moment, is we have kind of learned what is essential work. We've learned it because it's what's still going on, even when most things are shut down. And it's also what we miss when we were talking about art workers before uh, we went live here. Um, we've thought about now what is essential to keep us going and what's not. And that is actually like an amazing way to think about the world we wanna live in. What do we actually need? What do we actually want? What do we miss when we're locked down in our houses? And what is it that we're absolutely dependent on in order to continue to live? And then how do we divide up that work? Rather than like just talking about jobs and we need jobs and all these people have been laid off and we need like a jobs guarantee to put them all back to work because I don't know, otherwise they're making too much noise in the streets. Um, I look at it and I say like, what is it? What is the work that needs to be done? And how do we actually make a society that prioritizes that work, right? Something that you said to me, Tiffy, at the conversation we had at the beginning of all of this about thinking about making a society around that life-making work. Um, and so I am all for abolishing the police. I'm also all for abolishing all wage labor um, and thinking about other ways that we can actually understand the work that needs to be done and how we do it and our responsibility to each other to make sure that it gets done. Amen to that, Sarah. <laughs> Abolishing all work for the boss and working for ourselves in, in a collective manner. Kathy. Well, you know, as a nurse, one of the things that we have been pushing for a long, long time is making sure that healthcare is a human right. You know, the fact that we absolutely need Medicare for all and that we shouldn't, people shouldn't have to, uh, we, we, we need to get the insurance company out of healthcare. And we know that there's enough money. There's enough money for healthcare. Uh, you know, recently, what was it, $3 trillion in COVID relief funds, but all that money went to huge companies. It's important that we value the fact that healthcare is a human right, and there shouldn't be, you know, only for the privileged few. So we really need to take a look at what's happening today. You know, the kids are out in the street, we're all protesting because of what they're seeing. And it's time to make sure that we're putting the money where it needs to go. Not into policing, but into our communities. Our communities that desperately need that. You know, one of the things that as a nurse, you know, when I was growing up, there was a school nurse in every school. What happened? We had counselors. You know, now there's police. They don't need to be there. Just like healthcare. People should be able to walk into a clinic and a hospital without having to worry whether how they're gonna pay for this or how are we gonna pay for our medications. That shouldn't be. So, you know, I, there's a lot that we can do. And as nurses, we're all about universal health care, Medicare for all, and we can do this. So we're gonna be out in the streets fighting with everybody else to defund police and reinvest into our communities. Thank you, Kathy. So um, we, it, it's been so wonderful to listen to all of you that we are actually very close to the, our closing time. So I'm going to take one question from the audience, which I think is a perfect question to round us off. But before I want to give our speakers the last word. So I just want to tell you all, um, to visit the Pluto website for all their amazing um, books, especially by writers of color. I also encourage you to look up Spectre Journal. 
um, for a really uh, incisive anti-racist um, commentary. We also have uh, dispatches from the front lines of care where Bonnie Castillo kicked off our series um, from NNU. So please visit both Pluto and Spectre for your latest provocations against the state and for your latest social movement updates. So the final question that is coming from the audience, um, which uh, shall we reverse the order of speaking so that um, Jesse, you don't have to always uh, face the <laughs> first question. So can you discuss the potential for connecting this rebellion, this particular uprising in the US to a broader anti-imperialist left strategy internationally? Black Lives Matter in the United States to a broader worldwide thing. Well, you know what? Racism is everywhere, whether it's in the United States or in any other country. And I think that that was actually evident by not only in the United States, the various um, states that were marching in the United States, but also worldwide, you know, um, because unfortunately racism exists everywhere. Um, and I think that young people, you know, I'm, I'm of age, I'm a spicy seasoned person, so I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but, you know, in the 60s when I remember, you know, during Martin Luther King and, and the march to Washington, I, what I'm looking at now is seeing these young people that say, are saying, I've had enough, this is enough. And so it's white, black, brown, yellow, everybody is out there saying that we need, this is a people movement and it is happening across this globe and change is coming. So that 1% needs to get ready because the 99% is ready to make a change, to make this world better. And nurses are right there with you. Yeah, I think one of the most amazing things for this is um, I spend a lot of time in London these days and watching and having friends there sending me pictures from the massive marches there. But also, um, I was thinking about this sort of conversation around statues that we're having as these statues come down, as the statues of Christopher Columbus. Um, I'm in Philadelphia, so some of you have probably heard that there's like an angry mob of white dudes protecting the statue of Christopher Columbus in South Philly right now, um, and that they actually beat up some people the other day, and the cops are encouraging them to do that. Um, and it's funny because people say that, oh my God, you want to take down the statues, you want to erase history, and it's actually a wonderful time to talk about history. Um, so I'm thinking of the statue that folks pulled down in Bristol in the UK and threw in the river. Um, and I had never heard of that guy before. I learned a whole bunch because people pulled down his statue. Um, this is a statue of a slave trader, right? Um, this is people explicitly making the connection between the movement that's happening right now and the history of the things that the systems that built the US, built the British Empire, built everything that we live under now and are the reasons that these countries, well, I mean, under the coronavirus, the US and the UK both sort of handled it atrociously, but in general, we are um, doing better than a lot of other places because of that wealth that was created back then. And so I think there's, there's a really amazing moment opening up right now where people are talking about this history, talking about why we have statues of Christopher Columbus that, that white dudes with baseball bats are very invested in protecting. Um, you look at that and you're like, you're seeing the like literal defense of white supremacy right there, right? Um, and yeah, it's an amazing time to talk about how all of these networks are connected and they connect all of us and they need to be not just dismantled and not just sort of apologized for, but actually grappled with and unpicked. Thank you for that, Sarah. Absolutely. I've been um, designing lesson plans in my classroom around the statues and the debate around who we honor in the class. So I appreciate you raising that. Um, it's been wonderful to share this time with you all. I, I broaden my 
of what's going on right now by listening to all of you. So thank you for sharing everything. I think this last question is really important because the ability of the US billionaire class to hoard the obscene amount of wealth that they have is contingent not only upon oppressing the domestic working class and black and brown and um, indigenous people here, but it's contingent upon expanding their power all over the globe through, through uh, economic imperialism and military might, right? It's about oppressing nations all over the world. And that's why we can't ever get free here as black people in the United States if we don't link our struggles up with oppressed people all over the world. We're, we're, our future is bound together with theirs. And that's something that the black struggle has taken seriously for a very long time. You can look back at the Spanish-American War where the US brutalized and massacred children and families in the Philippines. And the statements from the AME church um, where black folks said, we're not gonna go fight in a war to oppress other people around the world when we can't, uh, when we don't have basic rights here at home, right? And you heard those words echoed in Muhammad Ali's uh, mouth when he said, I'm not going to go kill poor uh, brown farmers in Vietnam. Uh, they never called me the N word. And um, my fight is right here at home, right? Um, and so all throughout history, the black struggle has built solidarity with the people our, our nation oppresses. And you can see it happening again today. And I think especially with the question of Palestine, um, there was a 32 year old special needs student who was uh, chanting black lives matter and Palestinian lives matter. And he was gunned down by the IDF, right? And um, our people here, uh, leaders like Angela Davis and other uh, black people in the struggle took up that cause. And I think it's, it's really amazing to see the black struggle building solidarity with, with Palestinians right now who um, face some of the harshest oppression, um, face an out and out apartheid regime and I think that, um, you know, it, it really was, that solidarity was concretized in the streets of Ferguson during the uprising after Mike Brown was shot when Palestinians were uh, tweeting out um, guidelines for the black activists in the street about how to deal with the kind of um, mace they were facing because the mace was made by com Israeli companies, right? And so, uh, that kind of solidarity is required if we're ever going to win. And so uh, I am looking forward to seeing uh, the global struggle continue. Thank you so much for everyone who joined in. And I hope in your homes, you're keeping safe and keeping your loved ones safe. And I hope all of you will in the privacy of your home, give a big round of applause for our panelists, thank them. And I hope you will join us in the streets, wherever city you live in. Thanks so much and goodbye.